Listener supported. WNYC Studios. This is Science Friday. I'm Ira Flato, broadcasting today from the studios of KCLU on the campus of California Lutheran University in Thousand Oaks, California. Later in the hour, an update on where world nations stand on curbing carbon emissions and avoiding a climate catastrophe. But first, Thursday morning, two astronauts en route to the International Space Station had to abort their launch after a booster rocket malfunction. The Made an emergency descent back to Earth, and uh, happy to report both are doing well, both landing safely. Rachel Feltman, science editor at Popular Science, is here to bring us up to date on the launch and other selected short subjects in science. Welcome back, Rachel. Thanks for having me, Ira. Anything more about what went wrong there? Yeah, so we know that about two minutes into the launch, there was some kind of booster failure, and they had to undergo what's known as a uh, ballistic landing, uh, ballistic descent, which is so-called because usually they uh, make kind of a, a shallow angle as they come down to create a little bit of lift and take away some of the um, the, the force on, on the astronauts during the landing. And this is where the rocket is really Really coming down more like a projectile. And yeah. this has happened before, but only ever um, during landings, which, of course, appears a lot less dramatic because uh, they were supposed to come back down to the ground in the first place. So this is the first time they've ever had to make uh, such an aborted landing during a launch. And um, the Russian space agency said immediately they would begin investigating. Yeah. And uh, so far, that that's all we know. Well, the good news about it is that it worked, right? Right. <laughs> they hadn't it, done it before. <laughs> right. And again, this is rare, but the kind of thing that astronauts train for all the time. So right. not something that happens a lot, but certainly one of the procedures that they are expected to uh, mm. occasionally encounter. So, you know, not something we want to have happen, but something that is certainly on the roster of things they have learned how to handle. Well, but, but but with the Soyuz capsules being the only way for humans to reach the International Space Station, isn't this now you know, a little bit of a problem? There's no other way to get up there? Right. So there are, um, I believe, three Soyuz missions planned uh, that are now kind of up in the air because the Russian Space Agency, again, is undertaking this investigation. And so it's possible some of those will be put on hold. And even if they're not, uh, you know, those two crew members who were counted on who are are now on the ground instead of on ISS uh, mean that there's there's probably going to be uh, a gap in staffing. You know, we have three people on the space station right now, but they're scheduled to come back in December. Now, they could extend their stay a bit, but the Soyuz capsule they have up there that's going to bring them home, I believe it's only uh, it can only stay up there through sometime in January. So uh, that's the longest they'll be able to stay before coming back down. And that means that the space station probably will be uncrewed for some amount of time, which is something that we know should be possible. There are procedures in place for it, uh, but I don't believe it's ever happened before. Hmm. It's interesting. I will, I will have to check on whether there are experiments up there that they have to yeah, you know, put on hold or whatever. Certainly, you know, every astronaut who goes up has a fully packed schedule of scientific experiments. So uh, NASA and the ESA and the Russian Space Agency are certainly going to have to at least rework schedules. Yeah. And I know there are a few spacewalks that are now um, up in the air, so to speak. So to speak. Uh, let's, and, and other bad space news, the, the Hubble has a problem <laughs> this week, too, right? Right. But again, uh, you know, not a totally uh, pessimistic uh, message from NASA on that. So the Hubble is 28 years old and uh, has done fantastic work and hopefully uh, still has a lot of years left in it. But it, it certainly is not a new telescope. And the gyroscopes that uh, we use to keep it in position while it, you know, looks mm -hmm. out and, and takes all these amazing images of space for us. Uh, one of them is malfunctioning. It's been glitching for about a year, and the backup that was expected to replace it didn't quite act the way NASA wanted it to. So uh, the telescope basically went to sleep on uh, the 5th of October, which is just to say it's not mm -hmm. uh, collecting new images right now while NASA tries to workshop the problem. They are optimistic that it's uh, they're going to figure it out. Uh, they're going to either get the gyroscope working or figure out a workaround uh, for a way to position it in the meantime. Um, 
They expect it to, you know, continue working into the 2020s and overlap with its uh, replacement, the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, but what's interesting is that the, the big problem is that it was designed to be fixed during shuttle missions, uh, and we don't have a shuttle program anymore. So we're kind of, uh, you know, running out of ways to yeah. fix the Hubble. So it does have, you know, an, an expiration date now. Details, details. <laughs> okay, let's move on to some other news. And there's a really interesting advance in reproductive medicine if, if you're a mouse. Yes. Okay. <laughs> great, great news for mice. Um, the Chinese Academy of Science put out a paper showing that they were able to use um, embryonic stem cells and gene editing to create mice from same-sex parents, uh, which has been uh, done before, but uh, they, they used a slightly different method these this time. And while the mice with two dads only lived about 48 hours, um, the mice with two moms lived to adulthood and had babies of their own. Um, so it's just kind of like another, uh, you know, small step forward in this, uh, you know, growing body of work that's teaching us how mammalian reproduction works and how we might be able to alter it. And that, that is a question, though, about why it worked with the, the, the mice with two moms and not the two dads. Yeah, you know, um, I it's just considered more difficult to do it with um, two male cells. It comes down to uh, they're, they're not quite um, parallel. I, I hear it referred to a lot as it's like zipping up the chromosomes. And there are certain genes that while both parents have them, they're turned off in males and turned on in females and vice versa. And so it's about about uh, you know tweaking these yeah. sex chromosomes yeah. so that they zip together properly. Finally, there's a study tip for students, a special kind of memory aid. Tell us about that. Yeah, so this really cool font called Sans Forgetica, um, and it's actually designed to be slightly more difficult to read than than most fonts. It's like kind of tilted and broken, and it's all about uh, this principle called desirable difficulty, which is a phenomenon in learning where you need something to be difficult enough that it holds your interest, you know, that it doesn't bore the person trying to learn the information, but not so hard that it keeps them from retaining it. So the idea behind this font is that it kind of breaks these traditional design principles so that it gets your attention and maybe huh. helps you retain information a little bit better. So there's no published paper on it yet, so we can't quite say how well it works, but it is a really intriguing idea. Always interesting to have you, Rachel. Rachel Thank Feldman, you. science editor at uh, Popular Science. And now it's time to check in on the state of science. This is Kate Yard. WWNO, St. Louis Public Radio, KKD Iowa News. Public Radio News. Local science stories of national significance. California's Channel Islands, a cluster of eight islands off of the southern California coast, have been compared to the Galapagos, isolated islands with unique ecosystems, home to some species found nowhere else. And five of the islands became a national park in the 1980s. Before that, they were home to ranching and farming and home to the Chumash people for thousands of years before that. But a cascade of ecological problems threaten the islands. Lance Orozco, news director here at KCLU, is with me now to talk about efforts to protect and preserve the ecology there. Welcome. Good to see you, Lance. Well, good to be with you, Ira. So tell us about the ecological problems, uh, a little bit of the history. This is nothing new, right? No, it's it's really interesting. It's sort of like CSI for biologists here <laughs> because we had this whole chain reaction of things. But uh, you, as you mentioned, we had the ranchers moved in and they brought in cattle and sheep and pigs and other non-native things to the islands. But what happened was after World War II, a lot of DDT ended up in the ocean. The DDT ended up in fish. Now, the reason this is significant is the bald eagles, which are native to the islands, eat these fish. And it built up to the point in the bald eagles that whenever they would nest, the eggs would crack. So they would basically, they would sit in the eggs, they would crack. And the uh, bald eagles came to the point of extinction, so they brought in the bald eagles for a captive breeding program. Mm -hmm. So that opened another door. Golden eagles, which don't live in the islands naturally, said, hey, this looks like a great place to live because our, our uh, nemesis is gone now. So, so golden eagles moved out into the islands. The golden eagles, when they moved out there, started to eat the feral pigs that were out there. And also, this rare species of fox. It's called the island fox. It looks like a cat. It's a tiny little fox. They're cute. They're adorable looking. And the island fox are very curious about people. 
but the island fox doesn't have it in their DNA to be on the alert for the golden eagle. So the golden eagles basically started feasting on them, pushed them to the point of extinction. So you had this whole chain reaction. Biologists looked at this and said, okay, we need to grab what uh, island foxes we have left, we need to bring them in for a captive breeding program to try to save them. And so so you had this whole cascade of events, and so the biologists had to figure out how these things were interrelated, and they started to fix them. And, and it's fascinating. So what, what do you mean that they, they started to fix them? So what happened was they, they finally got enough of the bald eagles that they were able to reintroduce them to the islands. Then the golden eagles that had moved into the islands, they did a trapping program. They relocated them to another part of California and into Nevada as well. And right. then the island fox had gotten to the point where they could re-release them onto the islands. And, and, and they, they, they've just been growing. Now, Tim Coonan, who's a National Park Service biologist, um, I've talked to him for 20 years about this project. He said maybe in our lifetime we could see the island fox recover. It happened in less than 20 years. Wow. It's remarkable. Biologists around the world are looking yeah. at this because humans were able to fix the problem. But wait, there's more. There is more we... because, because <laughs> there's other non-native things out there. Yeah. There's eucalyptus trees and there's ants, specifically Argentine ants, which which you find on Santa Cruz Island, they went in and they said, okay, we're going to dust for these ants. We're going to get rid of these ants. But the problem is, how do you know that you've gotten rid of all the ants? Well, you have a little clip about that. Yes. We think the treatment that we did is very, very effective to the point that we cannot find any ants with us and our human abilities. Uh, we pull out over 60,000 lures. We're at a point where we think we did a really good job on the treatment, and we're bringing out this dog to try to verify our results to ensure that we can say, yep, okay, we're done. We did the eradication. Now, that's Christina Bozer with the Nature Conservancy. So what they did is uh, this group called Working Dogs for Conservation in Montana trained this dog specifically to find Argentine ants. The only dog of its type in the world. It went out, it checked out the islands, and it said uh, Santa Cruz Island is ant-free. In fact, now Tobias, I just checked up on Tobias, he's now looking for quagga mussels in Glacier National Park. And so he's moved on, but uh, they were able to show that the island is now ant-free thanks to the ant dog. So we have a happy ending. We do. A happy ending to the story. Thank you, Lance. Lance Orozco is a news director here at KCLU in Thousand Oaks, California. We're going to take a break, and when we come back, the countdown to the midterms, the midterm elections is on and just a month out. How secure are our ballot boxes? We heard that there had been some you know, interference in the last election. We'll see how more secure they might be. Stay with us. We'll be right back after this break. This is Science Friday. I'm Ira Flato. There is less than a month until the midterm elections on November 6th, and there's a lot of talk about hacking and voter security. The federal government has said hackers targeted the election systems of 21 states before the 2016 presidential election, but reportedly no information was changed or manipulated. Yet for the second year in a row, the DEF CON Underground Hacking Conference well, it showed how hackers could break into voting machines. So what are the real risks to our voting infrastructure? How can we secure these systems? How does all of this affect voting behavior? And our question for you listeners is, what is your top concern about voting security heading into the midterm elections? We want to hear from you. Give us a call at number 844-724-8255, 844-SCI-TALK. You can also tweet us at SciFry. What concerns you most about voting security heading into these midterms? Let me bring on my guest. Lawrence Norton is a deputy director of the Brennan Center Democracy Program at New York University. Welcome to Science Friday. Thanks, Ira. You're welcome. Uh, Charles Stewart III is a professor of political science and the founding director of the Election Data and Science Lab at MIT. Welcome to Science Friday. Hi. Glad to be here. And it's nice to have you. Um, Larry, I mentioned the Russians hacking during the last presidential election. What areas were the Russians or were the hackers compromising, and what were they, they trying to do there? I'm not sure that we know entirely what they were trying to do. First of all, I think it's really important when we're talking about um, there's a lot of conversation about Russian interference in the election in 2016 when we're there there are a couple of things that we're talking about when we mention that one is attacks on the election infrastructure um, but there's also um, the kind of political purchase of political ads social media propaganda and attack on campaigns uh, and their emails those are those are 
two separate things. Uh, if we're focusing on the election infrastructure itself, uh, we saw them targeting uh, voter registration databases. Uh, again, not entirely clear what they were trying to do there. Mm -hmm. um, and, and of course, voter registration databases are the roles that have the names of people and says whether or not they're eligible to vote, where they live, where they can vote. Um, and um, there were phishing attacks against... Um, uh, election officials. We know uh, that um, it looks like at least one uh, election systems vendor, which uh, manufactures e-poll books, was attacked. But I think um, we don't we don't know exactly what was going on. Um, unclear. Uh, just that there was certainly a lot of um, looking around on their part. Well, was that was that the vendor company that, that was putting PC anywhere? On the, on the machines as maintenance, but the software wasn't taken off? Is that what you're talking about in that case, or is it something different? No, no. What I'm talking about is um, uh, there, there uh, is a company, VR Systems. My, actually, I think they may still... <laughs> they may still... Uh, uh, not have confirmed whether or not there there certainly was an, an attempt to hack them, um, and, and again they manufacture e poll books and and uh, deal with registration databases. Um, electronic poll books are what you kind of what are used. They're often uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, tablets or or, t or or computers that are used to check people in. Um, and uh, uh, as I said, uh, last I checked, I think they, have, they, they may have denied that they were actually successfully breached, but at least in one of the Mueller indictments, there was an indication that there was some vendor, and it sounded like them, uh, mm -hmm. that, that was actually breached. Uh, uh, Charles Stewart, the, we were talking about these kind of hacks, but how else could a voting machine be compromised? Well, um, uh, well that's actually a, quite a controversial question. I mean, you, you mentioned, um, well... So let's start off by making distinctions, and, I, and Larry really helped um, um, in making the distinctions among the Russians, um, what they were doing in various ways, um, you know, perhaps to influence the, the elections, ranging from um, affecting the campaigns to maybe affecting the infrastructures. I think um, if we're asking about um, what can be done to hack into, say, machines and systems, um, you know, the first. Um, distinction we would make is between, you know, the voter registration systems, which um, Larry was just talking a bit about. Um, you alluded to with the 21 states um, that got attacked. Those are voter registration systems. Um, and then there are the voting machines themselves, which can either be electronic voting machines that are used in several states um, or potentially the scanners that are used to scan um, scan um, paper ballots. And if we're thinking about the voting machines themselves, either the electronic ones or the scanners, um, that's actually, the answer to that question is actually quite um, quite controversial. You made a reference to the DEF CON um, activities, and so what we do know is that if you have um, access to um, a voting machine, and especially if you have access for a long, long time, and the vulnerabilities are well known, that, um, you know, a, a, a decently competent computer science student can open up the machine and do things to it. Um, the um, What election officials will say is that, first of all, um, in general, the machines that have been broken into in DEF CON um, either have been retired or in the process of being retired. And then secondly, um, that the types of attacks that have been demonstrated to be successful against these machines um, require such a degree of direct access that in order to have um, actually an effective attack on them, um, and you would need some sort of inside job um, that would require um, a lot of attention <laughs> to particular machines and would be easily mm -hmm. detected. And so, um, but I mean, I think that's where the controversy is, that um, it's my sense that the computer science community thinks it's easier to actually affect this type of kind of brute force attack against um, the, the guts of the voting machines than the election officials do. They do. Are they right? Um, well, I mean, I tend to kind of, um, if I have to go with one side or the other, I tend to, my take on it is um, I've learned a lot from DEF CON about what the, um, what the vulnerabilities are. I think that the election officials are aware of those vulnerabilities and are taking um, 
um, are, and are taking steps to try to um, try to deal with them. I think that the important thing, nonetheless, is that um, the election officials that that are using electronic machines, especially the ones that don't um, have a, any sort of paper record of the election, I mean, they're in a position where they have to say, well, you know, given everything we do to try to protect the machines physically, we're confident that they're not being attacked, and we're confident because of the logic and accuracy testing we're doing that um, there weren't mistakes made. But a skeptic can, I think, rightfully so, even if you think the election officials have done everything they could, I think there is still room for a skeptic to say, yeah, but wouldn't it be great if one could independently verify that the machines weren't monkeyed with and there weren't mistakes in the programming? So, um, so I, you know, I, I tend, you know, I, I tend to fall on the side of uh, thinking that the machines right now for 2018 are well taken care of and are highly unlikely to be subject to the sorts of attacks that we see at DEF CON, but it would behoove, it would be good for the states to move in directions to make it easier to demonstrate to skeptics that that was true. I, I, if I could just jump in real quick sure, on that please. point. Um, uh, I, I, I think that to, to build on, on what Charles just said, uh, I do have a concern. I, I'm not sure, but I, I really buy the argument b because these machines are generally not connected to the Internet that we don't have to worry about um, uh, problems with them and potentially somebody reaching them in various ways. But, but um, more importantly, there's a, there are, there's a lot of the election infrastructure, of course, that is connected to the Internet. Um, mm -hmm. And an example of that might, an obvious example is election night reporting, which comes out, um, and that's how we get the unofficial results, although we don't call them that on election night very quickly. Um, that comes up on, on websites and gets reported out. And, uh, and we, we have seen, in fact, not in the United States uh, that I know of, but in other countries, uh, election night reporting attacked. Um, and um, if, if you get incorrect numbers there, in, in the environment that we have today, the hyper-partisan environment where there is um, a lot of false information put out on social media. I was talking earlier about that level of interference from the Russians in the 2016 election, casting doubts on election outcomes. If you don't have, as uh, as we don't in in, in a, 13 states, at least in, in some polling places in 13 states, uh, a paper backup that you can go back to afterwards and say, yeah, maybe there's been doubt cast on these elections, but we can go back and we have something that's independent of the software to tell us the results. Um, I, I think that's that's very dangerous, and I am hopeful that in the 13 states where we still have these um, paperless systems, uh, that we'll re be replacing them before the 2020 election. Yeah, you know, because uh, l last few weeks ago when I voted in my primary, Half the machines were down. The voting machines mm -hmm. were down. But I was voting on an electronic paper ballot, and they just collected all the ballots and said, we'll run them through the machines when we get them fixed. Yes. So, so they had they paved that very important paper trail to fall back on. Yeah, um, I th I, that's, a, that's a huge, um, important point to make. The, the, obviously, there were only about 25 days until the election, so we're not going to be doing any um, massive revamping of our election infrastructure. In fact, people are, as, as you point out, people are already voting. Um, but having um, making sure that we have redundancies in place mm -hmm. um, so that people can still vote and, and that if there are problems, we figure out a way to count those ballots is really important. And um, in, some, in some states, there are no paper ballots. Uh, in, in, in parts of 23 states, I believe, um, there aren't a paper ballots. People are voting directly onto electronic machines. And it's really important in those states for them to have uh, emergency paper ballots that they can break out right, right. Uh, if machines go down. And I would say they should have two to three hours worth hmm. uh, on hmm. Election Day. Yeah, yeah, and, and and if I can just um, pipe in here, I mean, I, I think that there's a there's a big general point um, to what Larry is saying, and and it's a point that's being made a lot these days in the election space is that um, there's been a lot of focus on how do we secure the various election systems, whether it be the machines or the, or the voting registration systems. There's also the matter of building resilience into the system because we know that at some time in some place, things will either break down like you experienced or you know there'll be mistakes or there will in fact be attacks. And so then the question is, what, what is the backup and what is the backup plan? In the case of if you have paper ballots, um, although you might have electronic ballot marking devices, that's a backup. Up. If the voter registration system is down, if you're prepared with um, enough provisional ballots, um, or even um, a paper backup of an electronic voting system, um, then you can move ahead. And um, you know, if if 
um, and those are the sorts of things where when I look at state and local officials, you know, that's what I want to know about is what sort of resilience and, and emergency planning is going into the operations just as mm-hmm. much as I'm interested in, well, you know, do you have this sensor on your servers? Do you have this sort of two-factor authentication on your, on your, on your email, et cetera? Uh, Lawrence, uh, uh, is the Brennan Center more concerned about the voting system or the possible suppression of the voting registration of candidates? Yeah, I mean we're <laughs> we're concerned about we're concerned about both for sure. I I think and I think both of them um, uh, contribute to uh, to cynicism about the process, to concern about the process. Uh, I do think you know we've seen. Um, an unusual number of uh, voter purges uh, in, in, in the last couple of years since um, since the Shelby decision that struck down an important part of the Voting Rights Act in states that were covered before uh, and that had to get preclearance for th- for for doing things like purging voters. Um, we've seen a massive increase in states like Georgia and um, and Texas and Florida and North Carolina. And, uh, you know, I, I think when people see that, that um, people that legitimately should be entitled to vote and show up at the polls and told they're not on, on the rolls, um, for whatever reason, and it could be because there's, there were mistakes, programming errors, or it could be because they were, they were improperly purged, um, that creates a lot of doubt in, of, in the integrity of the system. One thing that I would say to everybody uh, in the run-up to the election is they should be checking their voter registration. That's an easy thing to do online. Uh, if there are problems... Even if they think they're registered, they may not be. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And, and in fact, that's, that's an early, that can be an early warning sign for election officials that, that, hey, maybe I need to figure out what's going on here. Maybe there's a problem. So I think that's really important to do for the voter because it'll also remind them of where they should be going to vote and they can feel confident about when they show mm-hmm. up on election day. But I think it's also important for the mm-hmm. system generally. Um, Ira Flater, this is Science for Friday from WNYC Studios. Uh, uh, Charles, you looked at how the public sentiment towards election security, uh, what it feels, if, if they think our voting systems are secure, do they? Um, well, actually, um, they they do for the most part. I, I did a um, I did I did a survey um, just over the weekend, um, last weekend, which um, um, replicated something I did in May, and I asked um, a representative sample of voters, um, potential voters, um, whether they're confident, at least that their um, that their um, own county or locality is prepared for um, this November in terms of computer hacking, and about. Um, 60% or so of the respondents said that they were at least somewhat um, confident in um, what um, what's likely to happen in November, um, with um, not surprisingly maybe Republicans being a bit more confident than Democrats. And um, and that that partisan divide, by the way, is one of the reasons why I always um, kind of put an asterisk on any public opinion research being done on public attitudes about confidence and voting, whether it be in cybersecurity or just the vote count in general, and that these days everything is partisan. And, um, you know, voters' expectations about what's going to happen in November and whether we're prepared mm-hmm. on the cybersecurity side um, is as much um, is as likely to be determined mm-hmm. by their partisanship as um, attitudes about almost any other issue. Is, is voting security a politically partisan issue? Um, a little bit. Um, I mean, it's surprisingly nonpartisan in the sense that, I mean, there are Democratic and Republican differences on the cybersecurity front, um, but they are, you know, you know, they're the sort that a political scientist would write home about, but maybe um, everybody else would yawn at when you compare it to, you know, it, attitudes about abortion or health care, for instance. Um, but um, when you look at uh, other survey um, research that I've done, Democrats, for instance, are more likely to be concerned about fl- um, foreign attacks, foreign influence on elections. Um, Republicans are more likely to be concerned about 
about um, internal um, cybersecurity problems, which is, I, I think, consistent with Republican concerns yeah. in general about um, um, fraud and other things that happen domestically. So there is, you know, th- there are those kind of differences that are kind of reflective of the 2016 election. But nonetheless, Republicans and Democrats alike are both concerned about cybersecurity in elections, and both of them on the whole are confident that their local mm-hmm. officials um, are, are, are doing the right thing. All right. That, a very interesting topic. We'll have to take it up more and maybe even before the weeks before the elections and get an analysis when the elections are over. I want to thank both my guests, Lawrence Norton, Deputy Director of the Brennan Center's Democracy Program at New York University, Charles Stewart III, Professor of Political Science, Founding Director of the Election Data and Science Lab at MIT. Thank you both for taking time to be with us. We're going to take a break and come back and then have a progress report on how the world is doing with curbing carbon emissions, a new IPCC report. Report. Stay with us. We'll be right back after this break. This is Science Friday. I'm Ira Flato. Back in December of 2015, 195 of the world's nations took their first steps down a long, unclear road to addressing climate change. In signing the Paris Climate Agreement, nations agreed to keep the increase in global average temperature to, quote, well below 2 degrees Celsius, a critical point at which the planet gets locked into a future of catastrophic impacts, such as rising sea levels, more devastating floods and droughts, widespread food and water shortages, and and more powerful storms. And to ensure that we don't get too close to that two-degree tipping point, the agreement asks countries to limit the temperature increase to just 1.5 degrees Celsius. But how much does half a degree save us from the most devastating impacts of climate change? A new report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, this This week has shed some light on that. It highlights a number of climate change impacts that could be avoided by limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees compared to 2 degrees or more. The conclusion, every bit of warming even that 0.5 degrees matters. Here to break down the report and tell us how world nations have been doing trying to curb emissions over the last three years is Dr. Kelly Levin. She is Senior Associate with the World Resources Institute. Dr. Levin, welcome back to Science Friday. Thank you so much. Great to be with you. We want to send out a shout out to our listeners uh, with this question. As we barrel toward a one and a half degree increase in global temperature, are you worried? Are you worried about climate change impacting where you live? Give us a call on number 844-724-8255, 844-724-8255. You can also tweet us at the SciFry. Um, so, Dr. Levin, the, the, the goal is to prevent a two-degree increase in average global temperatures, but this report tells us that even a 1.5-degree increase is going to bring some pretty big changes. Yeah, that's absolutely right. So the um, Paris Agreement actually has these two goals, as you said, to limit warming well below 2 degrees and pursue efforts for 1.5 degrees Celsius of warming. And that was because for some of the most vulnerable countries, you can think about small island developing states, um, 1.5 degrees Celsius is also going to harm well-being to a tremendous extent. So what this report did was look at what are the differences between warming of 1.5 degrees Celsius and 2 degrees Celsius of warming, and how much harder is it to get to 1.5 degrees Celsius as opposed to 2 degrees Celsius. And they found that, indeed, we are definitely not on track, um, and the half a degree of warming actually can make a tremendous difference. And for example... So, for example, um, what they found is they looked across a number of different systems, and they found, uh, for example, for extreme heat, the percentage of the global population exposed to a severe heat wave, which we've already started to experience with one degree of warming, um, at least once every five years is two and a half times worse with two degrees of warming instead of 1.5 degrees Celsius of warming. If you think about um, sea ice-free Arctic in the summer, um, when you don't have 
have any ice um, on top of the Arctic. Uh, this could happen at least once every 100 years with 1.5 degrees Celsius of warming, but at least once every decade under 2 degrees Celsius of warming. And that can impact climate change even further because you have a dark surface that opens up underneath the ice and it absorbs more warmth. Sea level rise is 0.06 meters more with 2 degrees as opposed to 1.5 degrees. And while that doesn't sound like a lot, that translates to millions more people being impacted. Uh, species losses, um, two times worse for both plants and vertebrates that lose at least half of their range under 2 degrees of warming as opposed to 1.5 degrees of warming, three times worse for insects. Um, uh, f almost 40 percent worse uh, under 2 degrees versus 1.5 degrees for the amount of permafrost that would thaw in the, Ar in the Arctic. Uh, so these are some really big numbers. One of the most um, devastating and surprising ones to me was for coral reefs, where the report found that under 1.5 degrees Celsius of warming, we would see 70 to 90 percent of a further decline in coral reefs, with 2 degrees more than 99 wow. percent, uh, which is just wow. tremendous. Wow. Does it look like there's any way we're going to be able to stay under that 2.0 degrees? So what the report finds is that both um, 2 degrees Celsius of warming and 1.5 degrees Celsius of warming is technically feasible. Um, there have been a lot of modeling studies where analysts come together and see what would have to happen um, to make that transition happen. Um, Right now, uh, emissions are roughly 52 gigatons of carbon dioxide equivalent. They're projected to increase even with the climate change commitments that we've made under the Paris Agreement by 2030. Instead, we essentially need to have that amount and go down to 25 to 30 gigatons of carbon dioxide per year by 2030, and then we actually need to phase out net emissions altogether by mid-century. So this is a tremendous transformation and decarbonization rates that are truly unprecedented at the scale of what we are talking about. Um, it also would require behavioral and technological shifts across the board. So for example, by 2050, we're talking about renewables projected to supply 70 to 85 percent of electricity uh, to be able to meet 1.5 pathways. We're talking about reducing energy demand, increasing the efficiency of food production, changing dietary mm -hmm. choices, um, a, a lot of different measures uh, which we're um, just starting to do in certain right. locations, but not at the yeah. scale we need. Uh, so, you know, the president said he wanted to know, quote, who drew the report. I won't go there with that. Can you, can you answer at least who commissioned it? What data they used? Sure. So... Um, the, the way that the IPCC works um, is, um, in, in this particular case, under the Paris Agreement, there was an accompanying decision, and that decision um, requested the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, to put this report together. Um, and what the scientists do, they commissioned about 100 different scientists um, and had a very lengthy review process of several different drafts being um, reviewed, publicly reviewed, and I was one of the reviewers for that. Um, the scientists basically assess all of the recent literature, and in this case on 1.5 degrees Celsius, and see what the science says, um, up to a certain cutoff point where the literature is published. Um, and then they put together a detailed technical analysis. Interestingly, in this case, um, there's an accompanying summary for policymakers, which was agreed upon in Korea um, about a week ago. And that all of the governments signed onto, including the United States, and that is actually something that that um, negotiators come, make sure that they feel comfortable with the um, the implications for policymakers. So in this case, um, part of the answer is that the United States um, did actually endorse this report. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, we have a lot of people who want to talk about it. I'm going to go to the phones to Janice in uh, South Carolina. Hi, Janice. Yes, hello. So, so I'm in agriculture, and I think what ends up confusing people. When you talk about one and a half degrees, people aren't real excited about it. What really hurts us in agriculture is the high temperatures, the record high. So, for example, in the Midwest, if corn gets over 95 degrees Fahrenheit at night, it kills the pollen and greatly reduces yield. Or in the Central Valley of, Ca of California, when tomatoes, when the pollen temperatures get very high, over 100 degrees, that kills the pollen. And so this is really critical of the, are the highs, not just the average temperatures. 
And, and we can fix this by growing more plants. That's what the little ice age was about. The North American forest grew back for 150 years after Columbus, and all these trees took so much CO2 out of the atmosphere, it's cooled the planet off so much we had a, a little ice age. And I wish more of the scientists would talk about that, because we can, we can substitute a lot of our renewables, can be biofuels, biogas, other things like that, that will in, it'll make us grow more plants, and we can hmm. have them for food, feed, and fuel. I have. Are you are you a farmer? No, I'm an egg researcher actually, but I have a small farm, and I'm the developer of the Energy Tuber, which makes food, fa- food, feed, and fuel all in the same acre, and it uses little water and nitrogen. And you know, hmm. everybody thinks we're going to have some, you know, put CO2 in the atmosphere. Well, heck, all the plants will take it up if we switch to the renewables using plants. All right, let me get a comment. Thank, thanks for your call. What about that? Can we suck some of the CO2 out and reverse some of this? Thanks. Um, it, it, some really good points here. I think, first, um, as... Um as you had mentioned, the 1.5 degree goal is for global average temperature increase. So temperature increase at any one location, especially on any one particular moment in time, as well as its impacts are going to vary. And that, that's an incredibly important point. Um, interestingly, the, the report does talk extensively about carbon removal and um, says that not only do we need to pull out all the stops on emission reductions, but we actually have to remove carbon from the atmosphere and at a scale that we um, need to ramp up uh, significantly. Um, The models um, do look at the different uh, ways in which that can be achieved. Some of them are with um, afforestation, for example, with planting trees. Um, There are a number of technological options for carbon removal, for example, um, bioenergy plus carbon capture and storage, uh, where you use bioenergy and capture some of the um, carbon associated with it and store it. Also, direct air capture and storage, where basically these are huge machines that uh, that you have air passing through. You collect the carbon dioxide and then you store it. Um, there are some um, some challenges with um, with bioenergy and bioenergy plus CCS, um, and it's important to ensure that bioenergy crops don't displace other land uses, uh, so that they have the carbon effect um, and don't raise food prices and disturb ecosystems. But uh, certainly, managing our lands and soils in a way that they can suck out carbon much more efficiently is going to be critically important. But, uh, but uh, you know, we talk, we've talked about energy usage in the past. Uh, it's, it's, it's cheaper to make things more f- efficient so they don't use up as much energy than it is mitigating the problem later. Is the same thing true of carbon? It's, it's better to keep it from being emitted. It's much more efficient to do that than to try to suck it out of the air later. That's for sure. Absolutely. Certainly, um, reducing energy demand, energy efficiency, um, these are all going to be critically important. Efficiency of industrial processes um, and uh, changing some of the behavioral changes that uh, would lead to kind of more low-carbon society would be very critical. I'm Ira Flater. This is Science Friday from WNYC Studios. I, I mentioned some of the uh, uh, the things we're watching now, rising sea level the levels. We have more devastating floods, and we had a hurricane that's now gone off the scale this week um, and for some measurements. Are we not seeing, is it not fair to call these consequences of, of climate change or evidence, more or less, of climate change? Absolutely. I I, I think what's important, um, and I think one of the reasons why um, this report um, is really hitting home to people is that everyone is seeing the um, devastating impacts of just one degree of warming. And now we're talking um, with current climate change commitments, um, even if they were fully implemented, we're slated for 2.7 to 3.7 degrees Celsius of warming. Um, so that's a world that um, we don't know what that looks like. Um, certainly that that's better than without the climate change commitments, but we are talking about uh, tremendous changes um, across systems. Um, certainly, we have lots of evidence that um, the impacts unfolding around us um, have uh, human fingerprints, uh, and we can see the impacts of human activity um, in a number of different changes, um, including in storm activity, um, in terms of the amount of time that storms are sticking around um, in the Atlantic, the, the frequency, um, the intensity of storms. Um, 
the uh, sea level rise basically gives a higher onboarding for um, coastal inundation. Um, so right. we're, we're definitely already seeing a lot of impacts on Fulton. The amount Adams. of rainfall that's coming out of these that's right. storms is just uh, uh, amazing. But but you you scared me a little bit when you just said uh, we don't even know what it would look like in a, uh, above a two degrees Celsius increase. So, so um, what we do have is we have some models that um, look at what the projected impacts would be. And um, for some of these impacts, we have more certainty. And for others, we have less certainty. There are also these so-called wild cards um, that probably are, are low, low probability um, but would have very high impact. And where those thresholds lie, um, for some of those, we are not completely uh, sure. So if you think about um, shifting of ecosystems from a tropical forest Forest to a savanna-like state uh, because you have such extreme drought, um, that would be not only catastrophic for the ecosystem right. and biodiversity and services, but also for carbon, for carbon storage. You know, I'm, I'm frequently struck by people who say, you know, if we take, it's going to cost us money. It's going to cost taxpayers money to implement some of these things we're talking about. But the other side of the argument never gets talked about. It's what's it going to cost in terms of lives and capital and movement of populations and farming if we don't do any of these things? It's just it's so totally unbalanced on the other side. That's absolutely right. And interestingly, the report found that economic losses are actually much greater as temperatures rise. And with middle-income countries, so in Africa, Southeast Asia, India, Brazil, Mexico, um, projected to be affected the most, um, they looked at um, global GDP losses for 1.5 versus 2 degrees and found that um, it was significantly different. Um, a, a lot of these losses sometimes aren't even in the calculations to begin with, uh, and um, certainly if you have short-termism where you don't value later um, economic impacts, uh, as well as those that are harder to quantify, um, it doesn't get into the equation. So, uh, you know, we'll just have to wait and see what happens. I mean, because... It's not a pretty picture, the way we're headed. It's not a, it's not a pretty picture, but there is, there's a lot we can do and we must do. Uh, you know, first, um, in terms of the international process, governments in 2020 um, are invited to up their commitments and to increase the ambition of their mm -hmm. commitments. And that's going to be really important. Uh, what we know is the current commitments are not good enough uh, to get us on track. So I think um, making sure that uh, there's an expectation and a pressure for governments to do that. Um, but also for, for people not to throw up their hands uh, because there's an incredibly re important role for everyone to play, not only governments, but the private sector and also individuals and um, a lot of different things that um, individuals can do for sure. Uh, fact, the most... Yeah. Oh, so, sorry. What's the sing I, I was, single biggest thing an individual can do? I, I, I was going to say the single biggest thing is to, to get out and vote, um, because I think uh, we need to um, make sure that decision makers are taking climate change incredibly seriously and really turning the emissions mm -hmm. trajectory around. Get out there and vote. Thank you very much, Dr. Levin. Dr. Kelly Levin is a senior associate with the World Resources Institute. Thanks for taking time to be with us today. Thank you. Charles Berkowitz is our director, senior producer, Christopher Intagliata. Our producers are Alexa Lim, Christy Taylor, and Katie Heiler. We had technical and engineering help from Rich Kim, Sarah Fishman in New York, and Duncan Lively here at KCLU. Uh, we want to thank all the folks, the great folks here at uh, KCLU who made us uh, feel so welcome in their studios today. We're active all week on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all the social media. You can even ask your smart speaker to play Science Friday. So every day, sort of, now is Science Friday. In Thousand Oaks, California, I'm Ira Flato. Have a great weekend.